Welcome everyone to today's uh, A16Z Crypto Research Seminar. I'm very happy to welcome Rati uh, Gelisvili. He's going to be telling us about Block STM. I'm very excited because I've heard so much about this paper over recent months. I really want to looking forward to learning more about the details. So, Rati, uh, over to you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, so, yeah, very very happy to talk about our paper. Uh, this uh, was a joint work with uh, Sasha, Daniel, George, Zikun, Daria, you, and uh, Runtian. And the work started uh, while we were, uh, I think all of us were working at Novi. Uh, and now this is basically the engine that powers the execution uh, of the Aptos blockchain. So let me, uh, this is just a very, uh, very basic uh, motivation slide. Uh, as we all know, sort of uh, blockchain is a huge system and usually it has this layered architecture so we sort of have a consensus part of it where we agree on a sequence of blocks. Once we agree on a sequence of blocks, we sort of execute the they contain transactions, uh, like sort of this globally ordered uh, sequence of transactions. We execute these transactions. We actually execute transactions in a block, and then we sort of start uh, save them uh, in storage. But all we're trying to say here is that we we're trying. Everybody is trying to sort of scale up blockchains, make them as performant as possible. Uh, but the weakest sort of this involves because it's like a layered architecture. If one of the components is very slow, it's just going to be the weakest link. It's going to be the bottom. So that's basically the motivation to look at all the aspects of it. And uh, yeah, I, I, I believe uh, Sasha talked about consensus, right? But yes, we're, we're basically trying to tackle all of these challenges. And today is going to be about execution. So in particular, what happens here, as I said, is exactly we are, our input is a block. So we sort of receive this blocks, let's say like a P2 here, and then every validator, this is very crucial sort of requirement, right? Like basically every validator has to execute the transactions in B2. And then the output of uh, executing these transactions has to be sort of, uh, has to affect the global uh, blockchain state. And in fact, it has to be a deterministic uh, function, sort of application that happens at the end of the sort of output of the block. And there are a bunch of, because there are many blockchains out there, and there are a bunch of engineering approaches that we can take. Of course, we can just take all the transactions in a block in the order they're given to us and just go and execute them one by one. Uh, this turns out to be really slow. I mean, especially as you start pushing the performance, if you get stuck with sequential execution, this will for sure be a bottleneck. Uh, so nothing sort of groundbreaking in the fact that in this, at, at that moment, you want to somehow use parallelism, right? Because you have uh, multi-processor architectures, you, like every computer has many cores. You want to sort of, you want to utilize it to the, to the fullest, to try to sort of alleviate this bottleneck. So, and one of the one of the approaches that's pretty common is to sort of uh, uh, ask the users to declare either the dependencies or some sort of hints for where this transaction, what parts of the state this transaction is going to write to. And uh, I mean, we will talk more about this. This actually seems like this actually simplifies the problem quite a bit and allows some sort of efficient approaches, but it's quite limiting. So first of all, it's not ergonomic if the user has to do all this work. And moreover, what if you make a mistake or if you can't know exactly where the transaction is going to write, then the transaction may need to be broken up, it may need to be retried. Um, oh yeah, so so that's basically the, the limitation here. And so this, this brings us mainly to the design goals that we had in mind when we set out to sort of build this uh, parallel execution algorithm. The goal was to make it basically transparent to the users. So we have transactions, we want to uh, compute, the, we want to execute them, but we don't want to do it, we don't want users to do any extra work. From their perspective, we want it to be the same experience as if we were running sequential execution engine. Uh, and on the other hand, because we actually want to be practically motivated and in blockchains you want to be sort of uh, you want to have considerations against adversarial behavior and also just all types of uh, potential transaction loads 
it's possible that uh, every transaction will depend on something that the previous transaction writes. It's like unavoidable. And we want to build something that, in this case, doesn't isn't much worse than uh, the sequential execution, right? And this is very critical uh, design goal. But on the other hand, if there is parallelism, we want to uh, exploit it to the fullest. So essentially, it becomes like in, uh, try to extract as much of the inherent parallelism as possible out of the out of the transactions that we're given. So, what does transparent to users mean for you? So this was, I, I, I remember us discussing about this word and uh, what it's supposed to mean here is that they don't need to, they don't need to know uh, how the sausage is made. They don't need to know that we are running parallel execution. Uh, even if it was sequential execution, they don't need to give us any hints. They just submit the same transaction as it was before. But I would say invisible to use those. Invisible, I think would be, would be better, yeah. And uh, maybe another question: Are you thinking about malicious users? Malicious, mal malicious users, like somebody trying to exploit this to break the system? Or... Uh, yes, I mean, in general, sort of the the, the whole blockchain setting, we uh, we wanna uh, we we assume sort of uh, adversarial setting for this work. It manifests itself in a in a few ways, and one of one of which is. Because usually, like, if transaction is broken, we will see, like, uh, there is a whole, like, execution environment for it. And usually, like, that's in charge of making sure that, like, a single, like, sequential or parallel, it has to make sure that, like, a transaction cannot do something that's, like, not allowed by specification. However, as it pertains to parallel execution, for instance, if there was a way to construct uh, some sequence of transactions, that would break the algorithm or make it run for a century, we have to protect against that, right? And that's one of the motivations for saying, uh, no matter what happens, we want to design an algorithm that is uh, that is not much slower than the sequential, right? So that's like, we start there and we don't wanna be worse than that. It's like, uh, of course, there's gonna be some overhead. Like if you literally give us uh, transactions that are like just sequential, uh, we are we are we are dispatching all these threads. We're doing a lot of extra work, but as I will uh, hope, show you, uh, we managed to keep the overhead like pretty low. Uh, but great question, thanks. Uh, so so there is actually a lot of uh, academic work uh, in a lot of related topics, uh, which I'll try to sort of briefly overview. Uh, one work uh, is sort of called minor replay, and this is actually exactly for the blockchain setting. Uh, so minor sort of kind of feels like proof of work, but it applies universally. Like basically the idea is that there is someone, so you can view this as a, as a leader, for instance, right? So there is someone that creates the block. And let's say, so as I said, like, and we'll dive, dive deeper into that, but if we knew uh, where each transaction was writing, or if we knew uh, which transaction had conflict with each other, we can be smart and the problem becomes significantly easier. Uh, the, the point is we don't, we don't want to assume it, but so over here, the, the idea is that, let's say the, the leader that creates the block uh, can execute the block, can see sort of what the, what the behavior was, what read what, what wrote what, or what depended on what, and then there is all this work kind of deals with uh, compressing that information, making that information as like easy to transmit as possible, as easy to execute as possible. But the idea is that all the validators can replay the same block and they can be much more efficient because the data comes with this metadata that allows them to run it more efficiently, right? And it's, a, it's in, in fact, for, from their perspective, the way these algorithms are designed, they can really run a very simple fork joining schedule uh, based on this thing that the miner or the leader tells them. What are some of the sort of limitations of this approach? And this is also where the adversarial thing comes into play, right? Part of it. So there is, for instance, a huge trust issue here, right? Like, uh, why would they tell me the correct information? Like, maybe they will give me adversarial information, and then I will actually be slowed down. I guess you can work around it and have a fallback that if it doesn't look like it's going very fast, I will just run it from scratch. But there is also an issue of latency, right? Because 
no matter what, like we are reducing kind of the tonal work because the validators are faster, but someone still has to run it in blind, right? And then the latency still adds up. And some of this uh, extra work, actually, we're trying to in, in still rely on some static analysis on pre-computation to sort of uh, make this uh, dependency DAG information as, as, as like compact and efficient as possible. Um, the, actually, one of the most related work uh, was from the databases literature. There is this famous paper called BOM. Uh, so what they did was uh, they built a system that executes given set of transactions in a fixed preset order. So the order is set in stone. You're just trying to execute it as fast as possible. This paper makes the following assumption. It assumes that we can have a, and I will explain, we can have a perfect overestimation of where the, where the transactions are, each transaction is going to write. And what I mean by perfect overestimation is, again, like not the best phrase, probably. Uh, you are not allowed to underestimate. You are allowed to overestimate. Overestimation, if you overestimate and not actually right there, the, the algorithm will deal with it. It will induce some overhead, but not dramatic. But God forbid you underestimate, you have to run the whole algorithm from scratch, right? And how do we, have, how do we get this uh, sort of... Uh, overestimates becomes the same problem, either a static analysis, pre-execution. To be fair to this paper, in fact, they are in the database setting. And over there, it's like stored procedures. It's much more limited setting. So it's much, much more reasonable for them to make this assumption. Uh, sorry. Probably a stupid question. Um, so we don't talk about reading at all, but is that not relevant? It, so, uh, depending on an algorithm or approach, it, it would be because at the end of the day, so like actually how you design sometimes write write conflict matters, sometimes it doesn't. But at the end of the day, read write conflict is a is a key that you cannot run away from. All I mean is that this algorithm uh, relies uh, heavily on the it, it manages the reads, but it really relies heavily on knowing the writes. It doesn't really care if you know the reads or not. And I think the engineering approach that I said is also similar. So it just turns out that if you know the rights, there is a lot of sort of things that you can you can do. But I'm sure that like knowing the reads would also help. But yeah. Um, so the, the idea here is that because we have this perfect overestimation, uh, we basically can pre pre compute or pre build a data structure where we allocate a slot for every write that we estimate is going to happen. And then uh, we sort of, then what happened, the, the, exactly, like very good question, right? Because now every read, I know exactly what it is supposed to read, right? So it can just go and either read it or it can wait there. So there is still, because we're dealing with overestimates, it's possible that this location never gets written. So you have to deal with it in the algorithm. You have to actually mark it as like, oh, I actually didn't end up writing here. And then you sort of do a traversal and et cetera. But we're not here to explain this algorithm, but this is what it does, right? It's a it's a it's a really good algorithm. It's it's highly efficient, but again, it has yeah the the way it it has again this this drawback from our setting that we really don't want to require uh, right estimates. Uh, we want to assume that we want to let people write arbitrary smart contracts where they have secondary indices. Like I read something, and based on what I read, I do something completely different, like auctions, whatever. And here, an, any unestimated right is like very costly. Yes. So uh, how do you how, how do you think about locations? So uh, actually, good good question. So let me let me sort of pick some terminology, and I can I can use it for the for the rest of the talk. So it's uh, we can we can basically have this abstraction that the whole sort of state consists of these slots, like in like, or locations. So let's call them locations, and every write and read is just sort of on on those, right? And if you happen to write somewhere that like some other transaction is reading and that transaction is serialized after you, it would have to read whatever that like the latest thing that got wrote to this uh, location, right? And if I ever use a path, it's the same thing. It's just uh, something that refers to a particular memory location. So it, uh, an address would be a location. Is that how we would do yes. this? Or? Sure. So, or memory is also, I shouldn't use, right? In, in shared memory, that would be the, but yes. So there is this storage 
And let's say storage consists of this like locations and then we can identify it. like every transaction reads some of these locations and writes to some of these locations and can do like arbitrary logic expressed in a programming like language to do so. Cool. And, and then there is this uh, sort of prior work. It's like tens of thousands of papers, I think, with like uh, in like uh, award winning uh, sort of uh, papers uh, from uh, uh, from 90s, uh, which is called the software transactional memory. So this work is very relevant, right? The setting is very relevant. The idea was that uh, the idea was that we are giving like arbitrary transactions, and we want to atomically execute them. And so um, it was basically designed uh, or intended to replace locks and make this very easy abstraction for people to write. Con write programs and then if they have conflicts or not, this will be dealt by the framework, right? Um, and there are many, as I said, it's a very, very well studied topic and there are many different approaches and there in particular, the one that's relevant to us is uh, called optimistic concurrency control. So in optimistic concurrency control, you execute transaction and then there is, uh, you execute it optimistically, you execute it and somehow you execute it based on some states that you currently have, like the details might matter, differ from an algorithm to an algorithm. But then at some point you have this extra validation set. And what validation does is it basically checks uh, whatever you read, is it still, uh, is it still, if I, if I read it now, would it still be the same? And then again, sometimes there is locking involved, sometimes not, but the idea is that if validation fails, it means, well, I tried optimistically, but I, I didn't get the right uh, input, so I have to discard, it's useless, so I have to do it again. But usually if you succeed, you can commit. Uh, so you say, okay, so I can, I can use this execution result. Unfortunately, software transactional memory is rarely used in practice uh, because uh, these libraries are uh, sort of have limited performance. They have to do a lot of bookkeeping and whatnot. And for specific problems where you could apply software transactional memory, people usually just design handcrafted like specific solutions to that particular problem and it's more efficient. Uh, also generally outcome is not deterministic because all they care about is having some serialization order. But there is a line of research called deterministic software transactional memory where uh, the extra requirement is that no matter where and how many times you run it, you arrive at the same output. This would be apply applicable to us, and we actually benchmarked against one of the deterministic software transactional memory libraries. The thing here is that, as I said, like even SDMs, I, it's, it's a known fact, like they're not used in practice that much because they're not very efficient. And the line of research that does deterministic software transactional memories views determinism as an extra constraint uh, to satisfy. So they have even worse performance. They compete against each other, right? And we want better performance. We were like SDM performance is like black box SDM performance was for sure not good enough for us. The glimmer of hope here is that it has been shown in the past that for special, if you if you relax if you limit the scope to specific problems like linearizable queues, stacks, whatever you could sometimes design software transactional memory libraries for those domain problems and make that efficient. So there is a way to view, this is why we call it SDM, it's, there is a way to view our work as sort of a blockchain specific software transactional memory library. Even though a lot of sort of, I think some techniques that we uh, come, come up with are, are more general. So it's like your canonical example, you're like, suppose everyone's just pushing and popping on a common shared queue and right. that's all that's happening. And uh, I think there was more than that, but uh, yeah, this was, uh, Sasha had a paper about that and there was some other papers. Uh, the, the operations were limited, I guess, yes, it was like, uh, I think it wasn't just queues, it was sort of some generalization, some abstraction over this kind of data structures, but essentially yes. Um, and they could get deterministic and et cetera, basically. I'm not sure their thing was deterministic, but uh, well, the, the only point I wanted to make here is, is to be fair, right? Like there are STMs that are pretty performant, but usually they've been shown in like limited settings. Um, so this is actually, so I, this, there, there will be a few sort of places where I hopefully demonstrate that our like blockchain use case allows us to do certain things that are, that 
allow us to be efficient. Uh, so this is a good example of that, and it certainly like saves a lot of synchronization and makes our experiments more performant. Um, I wouldn't say that this is like the make or break thing, uh, but but it's a good example of a specific thing that uh, blockchains offer, where it is very helpful for designing algorithms. Uh, which is uh, we in the blockchains, as as we described before, right? You you want to execute a block, then you want to execute the next block. So in, in software transactional memory, you have this uh, long, potentially infinite like list of transactions that you have to process. You have to deal with like garbage collection. You have to deal with knowing what's committed at any given time. We can, we can just avoid worrying about it. We can garbage collect at block boundaries. And we can also just track when the block is committed. We don't need to know when like transaction five is committed. So you think there's a discretization of time because of these blocks that yes. helps. And it's like, it comes naturally, right? As a, as a part of the problem. And this saves a lot of synchronization actually, right? Uh, yeah. Um, the other one, which might be uh, a lot more powerful, I think, in terms of like designing algorithms for us is that um, what, uh, especially optimistically, concurrency-controlled algorithms have to contend with uh, software con transactional memory algorithms is that they never they run in some state, and this state. So here is an example: like a user might have some uh, invariants which are always satisfied in sort of sequential executions, but unless you take some extra precautions, you might violate sort of uh, this uh, invariance while doing optimistic execution. So for instance, uh, let's convince ourselves that no matter in which, which order you run these transactions, assuming also in the beginning X is bigger than Y, X, X is always gonna be bigger than Y, right? If you execute these transactions like atomically. But now if you're running them optimistically and just sort of just doing instructions concurrently with each other, this can happen, right? Like the green thread might write X2, then the perp, like then uh, the blue thread might read it, purple thread might write uh, sort of do two more writes and write X equals three, Y equals two, and then blue will divide by zero and make everything explode, right? So you have to have a way to deal with this because you cannot just uh, build an engine like for from a sort of software transactional memory uh, point of view. And there are like properties called like opacity and so on that deal with it. And then they have to make sure that this holds. And that also adds a lot of like synchronization and, and work, right? And complication. For us, again, our setting is much simpler because we know that we have a like smart contract programming language. And it's running inside a virtual machine that executes that smart contract. And in fact, the any behavior that is expressible in the language is an allowed behavior. It's VM's responsibility to catch errors, right? If you if if so, for instance, like division by zero will just be like a transaction will fail and it will return an output that I divided by zero, right? And if it happened during speculative execution. And this is not the real, like it was just read the wrong thing. It's fine because we're going to re execute it later and it will give us the right answer, right? We, but we don't have to worry about uh, sort of catching panics <laughs> and, like, I don't know, making sure this never happened. Um, yes, so we can continue running. Um, and then the last one is really, really key to sort of everything we do. I would love to say that sort of we made this observation first, but it's not true. Uh, Bohm like very explicitly made the same observation. I guess we kind of, we were inspired by Bohm, we were working on it, we, we actually did realize it, and then we were reading Bohm and we were like, wow, they literally explicitly say the same thing, uh, which, is, which is great. So the point is that there is, an, there is this intuition that um, if, if I'm allowed to choose from all the possible serializations, I will have more freedom. I should be able to run more efficiently, right? And there is certain truth to that, right? Like if uh, there might be specific blocks where depending on the ordering, there will be more conflicts or le less conflicts. However, uh, notice like just this very sort of uh, simple thought experiment, right? Let's say we're just some software transactional memory library and uh, the purple thread is trying to run transaction X, the green thread is trying to run transaction Y, 
a, basically if green thread never runs and just purple thread runs, eventually sort of purple thread will commit X and X will be serialized before Y. If green goes first, uh, Y will be serialized before X. And if you've seen sort of this uh, fisher lynch patterson kind of impossibility results for consensus, it's, it's very similar. Like essentially what we're saying here is that if serialization has to be determined during runtime, we are solving these very consensus-like tasks for basically every transaction that's running con concurrently because we are also trying to decide which one gets serialized first. And consensus is not an easy problem to solve. Uh, there, there are ways to solve it, but it inherently needs like synchronization, right? And this observation that Bohm made, and I, I believe we really pushed it to the limit, is that if I just fix the order, I avoid having to worry about what goes before what. And I can, I can sort of, I can do a lot of things now that will make my problem significantly easier. You mean given that you want deterministic? If we didn't want deterministic, will the preset order will also be a blessing? This is even this is even stronger. Exactly, this is even stronger. We are not. So if you just want deterministic, well, I guess if I, if I don't care about determinism, yes. like if I care about determinism, like I understand, like right. all the all your arguments can make total sense. Uh, but if you're saying that what that's a blessing of it if you don't need determinism, yeah, then I, I'm confused. I would even go that far, except with an asterisk that, of course, there is uh, this choosing the order element of it, right? So if you choose the order, uh, it's, it might be possible that I pre commit to this preset order that's just bad, and uh, you happen to get lucky and somehow run it in the, in the order that allowed you to run it parallel, and like maybe you beat me. But let's. Uh, but in like, but let's say if we were, if the order was, if other than that, right? Like if somehow you made everything equal or like if your preset order was like reasonable representation of all the orders available, uh, yes, this will destroy any possible SDN library out there that will not, even if they don't need to be deterministic. But if you don't want to be deterministic, why do you care? Like blue goes first, fine. Green because you have to decide, right? You have to decide. The algorithm is not explicitly solving consensus, right? The algorithm is sort of running things and validating and running the game, but inherently it's uh, trying to decide who goes first. Because if you abort me, you want consensus, and I have to agree with you that you were first, or some sort of leader election, right? And and Peston said, if I, if I, if if my right aborts you, then somehow I beat you, and and we are we are paying all this overhead to decide who goes before who. Uh, that's the intuition. But uh, as I said, this is this is something that we exploit a lot, and I'll show you at least two ways how this is very 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 beneficial. But the, the observation was made very explicitly by Bohm, exactly this observation. So just uh, making sure I understand that discussion. So this preset notion of the order, it's not about deterministic or randomized. It's about the fact that this ocean is this order is pre-committed to before yes. you look at the transactions that you're ordering. You can even look at the transactions, but it is uh, one point that you make is, uh, is, is crucial is it is even stronger than deterministic. It's like uh, deterministic would be like a deterministic STM would be just give me the same serialization every time. And this says give me a serialization that I pick at, like somehow we pick ahead of time. Like if this is going to like your output has to be the same as if you executed this transaction sequentially in this order that we like that is committed to ahead of time. Um, yeah. So the fact that it's ahead of time means it can't depend on the specific transactions that you're ordering, or it can. Uh, so you could have a like a different component that looks at transactions and determines an order, and then then we all execute it in that order, right? Uh, that would be that would be a way to use this system. But what we do right now is 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 what you're saying. Like basically, we just we just say let's take the order that like the transactions are in the block and let's just do our best right so this okay so we're all committing to a recipe a recipe that results in us all reaching consensus over the ordering we're aiming for yeah we just we just the preset. yeah we just we just agree we just Maybe agree on an order transactions but we like agree what the function is beforehand 
Uh, I mean, it's it's a bit confusing to phrase it that way, right? Because at the end of the day, the order means nothing. It's still the transactions that will determine everything, right? But you could say it will. It's always the order. Uh, you can and you can use it in any way as long as we have a deterministic way to agree on the ordering. It can be some function that we can all run and gives us the order, and now that's the order, right? Uh, as I said, for us right now, it's very naive. We just take like the, the validator proposes a block. It contains transactions ordered somehow. We will just take that, right? But actually, uh, it's a really interesting future direction to either find, like try to quickly guess what order would be good and use that as long as you have a deterministic way or like have a like unpredictability to something like that. Um, so the block producer fixes the linear the serialization, and then it's just now your job to speed that up as much as possible. Right. Okay. right. And actually, another so the paper just got accepted at Peepop, and in fact, we like one of the very useful feedback we got from the reviewers was uh, like as I already mentioned, like three almost separate lines of research that had connections, right? And there is also this thing called uh, thread level speculation. That like threads doing like computer architectures where you're just you are trying to execute sequential code, but you're trying to guess, right? Sure. So and and exactly, and there like also the the order is fixed, and you're just trying to do your best. So there is also like basically some similarities there. Um, so uh, maybe maybe I'm going too slow, but yes. Yeah, so this is a high level overview of sort of how the how the system looks. Uh, we have uh, we have like we have executor that basically where all these like threads lead, and we have a scheduler that uh, is the brains behind like what uh, it schedules tasks and tasks are either execute this or validate this. So and when you get the task, so you like a thread. So the way it's designed is basically threads just const constantly do the like repeat uh, a loop where they try to get a task. Let's say it gets an execution task. Then it goes. Then the thread goes to the VM with a particular task, like ex ex like a transaction that was given, and says execute this for me. Uh, while in order to execute that, the VM needs to make reads. Uh, reads will be from this multi-version data structure that I'll explain that basically wraps uh, storage, right? But it also includes some speculative things that other transactions might have written. So it will run it in this weird, whatever, optimistic uh, sort of view of the world. It will never write. It will just produce the write set and the output and will return it back. And then we can apply the writes to the, to the multi-version data structure. And sometimes, like actually, everything needs to be validated. It's still like an optimistically concurrent, optimistic concurrence controlled algorithm. So a validation simply just goes and checks that reads are still valid. And uh, then every time you do a task, you just have to go back and update the scheduler based on like what happened in your like like with this task. Like did validation fail? Did it succeed? Did, like uh, etc. And at the end of the day. Uh, when we're done, we can basically apply uh, what we have in this uh, multi-version data structure back to storage, and we we continue, right? And we can also, if there is more to the output than just writes, uh, we can just take the sort of last every execution output. But for simplicity, we can assume that it's just a global state; it's only reads and writes. And basically, what you need to at the end of the day, the multi-version data structure will contain the final writes, which are consistent with the writes that would happen if you executed everything sequentially. What does the validate do? How do you validate? Uh, so there is an implementation detail to make it more efficient by like uh, stamping everything. But essentially, you are validating that. Uh, whatever you read during the optimistic execution, you have your read set, which means like I read this memory location and this is what I read. I read this location, this is what I read. Like we reversion them so that we don't actually have to check the whole data, right? But that's a detail. And then you just go back and you reread the same locations and you make sure you just check whether it's the same or not. If everything is the same, you say validation succeeded. If anything fails, you say validation failed. And what so, happens after the failure? 
What, what if multiple of them fail? Do you like kind of go the same? You so every what is similar to what I've described before is that when a validation fails, it means you this transaction needs to be re-executed. So when you go back to the scheduler, you tell validation failed, it will internally update the state and mark this transaction abstractly as it needs re-execution. Does this mean that the commits that happen, the, the writes that happen in the execution of that transaction? Yeah, we will, clean, we will, we will clean the writes. We will clean the writes and actually we'll do something more than that, which is one of the one of the key pieces actually. But uh, yeah, we'll actually mark them as estimates, but uh, I'm getting ahead of this. Spina is really is a bad thing or is just like an overly broad check? Uh, so, so the, yeah, so the failure just like failure is obviously bad because we have to re-execute this transaction. Well, I, I'm not I'm not sure I understand this, but this part. So sorry for no, 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 just like like right. background, but like it's kind of it may be that in the sequence, like something should change after this yes. transaction. Yes. And like maybe this transaction should still go first. Why like, why do you need to push it later? We don't push it later. What well, well, we say, but but there is you just from dependencies, that's the so two things. Uh, first, we like because we have a fixed order. Things are a bit different than just saying like, oh, just basically for us, a failed validation means more than just a re-execute this transaction. And I will show an example. Okay. So I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah, yeah. Because because actually uh, we it's we cannot just take this transaction and serialize it somewhere else, right? It, it has a fixed order. So if some other transaction was successfully validated, but now this one is before and I have to re-execute it, it also means that the next transaction I also have to re-validate, right? But then we do, but, but actually that's exactly what I was going to get. Oh, actually, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about it. Wait, I'm wait. But so one, uh, one piece here that uh, I hope will be, like, it's, it's relatively simple because especially I also mentioned that BOM uses a similar structure, but BOM assumes that basically you have this overestimate, so you can statically create the data structure for every estimated write. We have a similar data structure. It's a multi-version data structure. This is also a very common thing in general, right? Where the idea is that different transactions do not overwrite each other's data. They just write to the same data structure and they just say, I'm transaction five, this is what I wrote, right? And this is a general technique that lets you avoid write write conflicts. And then what you do is like, okay, so transaction write by transaction six happened, you just put it there and it's ordered because we have an order, so that's convenient. And then a read will just have to like basically find the highest transaction that's lower than it in order to read that, right? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't find anything, it has to read from storage. Uh, but and okay, so this I also mentioned, but uh, um, it's it's relevant for the for the like technically novel things that we do uh, to understand. So the way the scheduler works, it has this global global queue abstraction. Of course, it's not implemented as a queue of tasks, but it's basically the the interface is that every thread just keeps going. Eventually, the scheduler will tell it you're done. But before that, it's just like give me the next task, give me the next task, give me the next task, and the scheduler is in charge of deciding whether it has to do an execution or validation, and if it has to, and which transaction, right? If you have to do a validation, it will tell you, uh, here is a read set, go validate, it's still valid, right? If you have to do an execution, it will tell you, uh, go, uh, go to the VM, execute transaction five. But internally, it has to have all this logic to, to dispatch these things, right? And so it has to essentially do two things. One, or it's very desirable that we do two things. Because we have preset order, we want to make sure that we run the lowest task that there is available to us, right? We don't. Lower means early. Uh, early transaction, yes. Because if, if like transaction five kind of needs re execution or validation, it's useless for us to do 100 because uh, most likely this is like uh, not going to be useful work. Um, and the validation must logically occur in sequence, meaning if we executed these three transactions and then we validated them and validation of two failed, we know that two has to be re-executed, but actually, actually three needs to be revalidated because two might change something and because we fixed the order, three will have to reread this. 
So this is just like we can go through this quickly. Uh, essentially, this is what scheduler does, right? It, it basically, uh, oh, and an important thing exactly from the previous example is that successful validation for us doesn't mean it's safe to commit. Uh, there is like a predicate that we use in our proofs to show that like eventually everything's committed to the state that it needs to be when the block is committed, but we don't even track what's safe to commit, right? There is a predicate that lets us know when everything is ready, but a successful validation is just nothing, but a failed validation is means that you need to re-execute and possibly mark other things uh, to require revalidation. Uh, and we also and the scheduler also manages dependencies. In fact, if a transaction tries to read a location where another transaction is estimated to write, we suspend it, we mark it as a dependency, and when that transaction re-executes, we continue. And at this point, you must be asking me. How the hell do you, you just told me you don't have estimates, you don't want anybody to give you estimates, like what, what, why, how are you cheating, right? And so this is actually one of the, one of the key ideas uh, in the paper, which is, okay, so where do the estimates come from? And what we, and it's actually really, really, really simple idea. And it's kind of changed, like, as I will show you, it actually changes, uh, it improves something that people have been doing for like many, many, many years. So essentially, what all we do is when a transaction fails, we know what it wrote before. So we just go and mark all of them as estimates, right? We're saying, look, I mean, you're running to, I mean, you ran in some states that wasn't quite the state you wanted, but this is what you produced. I'm going to assume that the next time you might, like, it's not for, say, like, we, we're just assuming that you might write to the same location. So if another transaction, so let's say transaction three aborted, we marked the previous thing as an estimate. Now, if a transaction five comes, I see an estimate. Essentially, the thought process here is, I know I have to re-execute three. Previously, three wrote here, so there must be likelihood that three writes here. So let me not go ahead, let me wait until three runs again and then run, right? And this is really important because one of the things that kill uh, STM performance is this cascading of words where like you sort of something changes and just cascades out of control. Uh, and let me say why this is actually important, right? It's a very simple idea, but, but, but why is it powerful? There is this concept called, so there is all this static analysis work, right? To guess the like, or user provided things. But a lot of systems, what they do when they need some sort of estimates for performance is they do like pre-execution. So you take all your transactions, you run them from the initial state embarrassingly in parallel, and, and then you take whatever they write and whatever they read as estimates. It's some sort of estimate, right? And this is this is a, just from the initial state, you see from the initial state. And the idea is okay, this is not perfect, but we just we just waste this one thing, but uh, but it's literally embarrassingly parallelizable, right? Um, and this is, this is a very known paradigm, right? It's called pre-execution. And you can view what we do as just a strict improvement over pre-execution. Uh, why is that? Because um, in a good case where we didn't have any aborts, we did not need to execute everything one more time, we just didn't. And when there are aborts, your, your meaning pre-execution, so pre-executions estimates were from the initial state. But here, every time a board, I am running in a more fresh state and my quality of my, so basically I generate estimates when I need them and the quality of them keep improving if I keep aborting, right? Uh, so this is, basically, this is basically the idea here. And for in contrasted with BOM, our estimates are just best efforts, right? Like if, if they're good, they're good. But if we miss something, it's not a disaster. And in the other approaches, if you don't, if you underestimate, you have to like run from the beginning. I was, I was just wondering, so this other task that sees an estimate stops and wait until this is updated. Yes. So could it happen that all of them got stuck waiting somehow in a, in a circle? So that's, um, we proved that that's not possible. The idea there is uh, simple because there is essentially boils down to the fixed order and just the descent, right? Because you can only get stuck on someone that's lower than you. So you cannot like infinitely descend. Make sense? Or yeah, because like the only you're only gonna 
uh, wait for something that you would have read, which would be some right estimated right by a lower, strictly lower transaction. And then if that transaction is also waited for someone, then again, 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 and you cannot go it. Into so is it, should I roughly think of it like the old solution, unestimated right, you have to go back to the very beginning, but here you just have to go back to like the sort of deepest unestimated right and go from there instead of the beginning? Is that how you think about it or? Yes, uh, I guess the, so, so at the end of the day, you're just using uh, the, all you're using the estimates from is to like, the worst that a conflict can do is to trigger you to re-execute because like execution is much, much more expensive than validation or anything else that we do. So any knowledge that you know that someone might write here, or read here, all you're trying to use it for is to sort of avoid this mistake, right? And this is also usually how pre-execution is used, but it can also be used in other contexts, in other situations. But yeah, so, but, but here you're essentially saying, I will start blind. I mean, if you actually, this is, this is another good point where if someone gives our algorithm some estimates, we can start from there. We can just mark them as an estimate, right? But we just start blind. But if we happen to abort, now I'm gonna like now I'm gonna use these as estimates, so I have at least like a set of things that I will will avoid me making the same mistake, and then we will keep going, right? And it does. And there are also two ways to deal when an estimate happens. Like one was to just like crash and do it again. I think what we do currently is just really just wait at that moment and then then restart. And funnily enough, we were really surprised. Like sometimes we would run sequential load faster than sequential execution. And we were like, what the hell is this? Like, what did we mess up? And then we realized what was happening because if you do it this way, it's possible that some prefix was useful <laughs> and you got lucky and you waited on this dependency. And then you could, so even though it's sequential load usually just means that the transaction has a read that depends on a write from here, right? But it might be like in the middle or in the end of this transaction, and then you could have done useful work here and then reused it. And this actually happened way more often than we expected. And every time we forget, <laughs> and then we see it again, we're like, "What?" But, but yes, that's uh, so. The other so this was one thing that I think allows our sort of system to be really fast. And I think this is not it's it's kind of novel. And the other thing is also a novel thing, which is again very heavily dependent on the preset order. So how the, the idea is how do we pick the tasks with lower transaction index? Because this is also really, really crucial for system performance. Um, so in fact, like my advisor has a bunch of papers about it. And this is also a very well-studied topic, right? Concurrent data structures, concurrent priority queues, concurrent uh, ordered sets. Uh, the big problem there usually is that if you do a priority queue, uh, you ever like you want to extract the lowest index, like lowest element or highest element, highest priority element. Everybody is kind of contending on the same element, and it's it's hard to parallelize. But they have ways, like they usually like relax the semantics, so you can take one of the one of the highest priority ones, and you can kind of scale it. It's it's pretty decent. But actually, for the performance that we were intending, given that was not good enough or we, we wanted to push it farther. And what we do is we again rely on the fact that our priorities are not arbitrary, they're, they're indices. Right? And they're like very well compact indices from one to the zero to block size, right? So what we do is essentially, I mean, you know, counting based sort. So we do basically a counting based uh, concurrent order set, right? So essentially the idea is that even though we don't track what's committed, usually some prefixes like usually the threads are working on some dense interval, like they're like executing and validating, right? Like everything here, even if we don't track it from God's view is committed and everything here, we haven't even started yet. So, and this is a very dense like set of indices. So it's like my assumption, you can only depend on things before you, right? Uh, yes, yes, and the reads and writes, but like, but, but for here, even that's not like, as long as we just keep a status per index, just looking what's looking for the next one, it becomes the traversal, right? You're just traversing the indices and you're looking like, oh, does it need validation? Does it need execution? So you just track an index, you like reset that index. The worst thing that happens is you have to walk over a bunch of empty slots, right? 
uh, and then we we optimize it a little bit. Like you can you can have either one index or you can have one index per for validation tasks, one index for execution tasks. Uh, but these are all details. So if I take if I have uh, k and all everything before k got commit got executed and validated already, and I validate k, then I can commit k. If it's committed, yes, but we actually never, we are experimenting with these things, but um, in the current version of the system, yeah, yeah, no, that's true, that's true, so. Like, I, 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 I get, like, are, you, are you using this property or like, so no, you're not using it as yeah, yeah, but, but it's true, but it's true. So uh, if, 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 if the K things are committed and you happen to successfully validate K plus one, it means that K plus one is, can also be considered committed. But we don't track it. Uh, we just, yeah. But but, but yeah, that, that property is technically true. The reason we don't even track it is like it allows us sometimes to even not do that sequentially. Like you can have five validations that all succeed and that all happen concurrently. And now technically all five of them are are uh, essentially committed uh, because if one of them one of them failed, it would mark all of them for revalidation, right? So, but, but, but yeah, what, what you said is for sure, for sure correct. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, yeah, so this is a, just an example. So we are at this index and essentially you can do fetch and increments and like some light synchronization. Another thing that we observed is like, so essentially what this index does, it just tricks the minimum of all things that we know requires validation or execution. And we just have to maintain that environment, right? Uh, but but the funny thing that happened also is that so fetch and increment everybody touches the same counter so that counter is kind of contended but it also gets amortized because in between you do the task and whatnot but uh but once you do that fetch and increment and these instructions are implemented in hardware they're relatively like they're very optimized but once you do that it also acts as a load balancer on individual statuses, right? Because everybody gets a different index. Like if I do a fetch and increment and you do a fetch and increment, it's a moment, like we get two different indices. So in the beginning, we were doing some crazy, like log-free things to sort of do build the statuses. And then in the process of productionization, we were like just replaced all, everything with locks. It's same performance <laughs> because fetch and increment is basically a load balancer. Uh, I will not go into this. It's just some uh, sort of uh, details that you have to deal in implementations and proofs. Uh, we, do, we have like 12 pages of proofs uh, to actually prove that it, it, the algorithm is correct in terms of what it will like. It will terminate and it will produce the same output as the sequential execution of the fixed order. Um, and there are some optimizations that are really useful, but I will not go into them because they're, they're, they're important for performance, but it's not like very fundamental. The only one I can mention is like sometimes it all becomes uh, a question of how, how early can we start validation? Because the earlier you can start validation, the earlier you catch potential aborts and you avoid the cascading. And also how, Still, how how can I avoid uh, doing useless work? Because when a validation fails, you re-execute that transaction, but you dispatch everything else for validation. Validations are cheap, but if you sort of do this wave after wave after wave, it will become it will, it will add up. So we have ways to sort of like if you execute it before and you have your set of where you wrote, and you get re-executed and you write, write to a strict subset of it we can prove that you don't need to revalidate uh, anything because they would have seen the estimate and like things like this, right? But they're neat, but they're not like uh, some foundational thing, right? They're in the context of the algorithm. And lazy commit I mentioned, it basically has to track how many tasks are ongoing and where the indices are, has to do that like atomically. So we do it by essentially doing a double commit, double, double collect. You read something, you read again. If it if it's the same, you we can prove that the block can be safely committed. Um, we prove correctness, and finally, I can I can show you the graphs. So the way we benchmark this is we benchmarked it. Uh, we also know that it helped the system end to end performance. It, it's running in uh, production, but for to demonstrate like academically what this thing does, we had to isolate the execution component. 
So, uh, and that means we sort of, we get a block that's ordered, right? We don't do consensus and we don't go to actual persistent storage because that's like expensive. So we, we have like some in-memory representation of all the states and we just, we just execute it in memory. And we have sort of a pl implementation on, on uh, the DM code base and also on Aptos. And we compared it to BOM. Uh, in order to be able to compare to BOM, BOM needs per like estimates, right? So we just gave it perfect estimates for free. Uh, so that's sort of an, like, because sometimes it will beat us, right? But it's because it knows this thing that it would have to work really hard for or would be impossible to get. And then there is Litten, which is this uh, recent deterministic STM algorithm, uh, which basically came out a few years ago and uh, has comparison with other deterministic algorithms and outperforms them. So we chose like it as a good candidate. And um, we tried it on peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So this is, uh, we thought it's a, uh, well, I, I will show you like this usually, People might think that this is just a very straightforward transaction. It's not like this transaction is very complicated, but it's also not very trivial. It does a bunch of reads and writes. Uh, and uh, I think at the DM days, it was for some, uh, a lot of uh, uh, checks that it had to do about like accounts and whatnot. And even at Aptos, it has to do a few extra reads like sequence number, whatnot. So it, it, it's non-trivial, but what's, what's a good thing about this kind of load is because it's peer to peer. Uh, we randomly choose who transfers to who, and by controlling the number of accounts, we have a very good control on the number of conflicts that we have to benchmark on. Uh, so, for instance, if we do take two accounts, it's going to be a fully sequential load uh, because every uh, because you, like every transaction will modify the same balance. It's right, read and write, and then we try incremental like 100, 1k, 10k, and we also try different block sizes. Uh, so one way which it seems favorable for you to take those transactions is like this seems like the worst of per algorithm is something that changes its outputs depending on the reads. Because you said, suppose you roll to some address X, I'm going to guess if you write to address X. And the yeah. worst kind of algorithm like maybe is like if yeah, yeah, yeah. some it's, condition write to X, otherwise write to Y. I, I agree. I agree. That's a, that's a very good point. Yes. Uh, that's a very good point. I think it would be great to also benchmark on that. Uh, although uh, it would also demonstrate this adaptivity of uh, getting pressure estimates. So I would be actually very curious. That's a, that's a really good point. Uh, so this was also the transactions that were e like, yeah, but th we can write our own transactions. So that's a really good point. Yes, we can definitely benchmark that. Just a thought. Yeah. Uh, no, thanks a lot. So le let me show you though for these ones what we observe. So. First, interestingly, for block size 1K, uh, we, the first thing to notice is we scale as we increase the number of threads for, uh, which, which is always a good sign if you're designing sort of a concurrent algorithm. The, the y-axis is thousands of transactions per second? Or... Yes, okay. yes. And, and so the number of threads, and I guess these are the, the, the lines themselves are like sort of it's tried for 1,000 and uh, 10,000 accounts here. And the black line is a sequential baseline. So a few things to notice actually. So the lithium, it scales with uh, sort of 10 to the four, but it's like, I, may, I don't know if that's order of magnitude, but it's like still significantly slower than us. Um, as you create more conflicts, it starts being worse than the sequential, right? And this was something that we really wanted to avoid. Now, against BOM, what's really interesting is uh, in, uh, in the, on the left-hand side, we actually beat BOM, uh, which should not be possible because it has perfect right estimates. So how, and, and for 10K, it actually beats us. So this might also be our implementation artifact, even though we tried to do a good implementation. But the point there is that BOM has to create, pre-create these data structures and that's not for free, even though we gave. And, and so I, I think sort of that overhead was why for smaller block size, we could bid it. For larger block size, of course, uh, it performed better, but it, it had this perfect estimate. Why does it matter whether the block size is 1K or 10K? Uh, this the only for only for BOM. Uh, and also as an asterisk, yeah, it's like our implementation of BOM. But in no matter what you do, you have to create this data structure 
ahead of time that contains like a slot for every estimated rate. And I believe the cost of that was so somehow, yeah, because like for, for 10K, the, the rest of the thing is faster and it makes up for the cost that you pay, even though like for 10K, I guess the data structure will also be larger, but they don't grow at the same rate, right? The, the amount of time, you spend some amount of time to build the data structure, but for 1K, it was in such a way that this was actually significant compared to how much time it took to execute that many transactions. But once you go to 10K, the execution time became large enough such that it wasn't important anymore. But anyway, that's like an implementation artifact. Uh, the more important thing is that we are basically in the same ballpark and that algorithm has perfect right estimates and we don't, right? I'm curious, what uh, growth rate should I have in mind for the number of conflicts as block size increases? For uh, like real load or? Yeah, I... That is an open question. I, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but there is, a, this is a really good question because I think uh, there are at least like, I mean, probably it's still early days for blockchain adoption, right? So uh, I believe it happened on many blockchains when some project came alive and it like dominated the load for extended period of time. And then uh, it can lead to a slowness or like whatever. So this is also the case when things might become more sequential, but you would hope that in a sort of in a case where there are lots of uh, different applications running and lots of different users submitting transactions, there would be a lot of transactions that would just be completely independent of each other. So like square root, maybe. Sorry. Oh, I was saying maybe square root in a very uniform random. That, or, that's well, yeah, very context-dependent. Like yeah. NFT yeah. drops very bad. Yes. Like just oh, yeah, people yeah, yeah. spending more money to each other. Like. Can you give us a benchmark of, uh, suppose we're not in blockchain settings, suppose you were doing this for DM or Visa or something like that. Would the same technology apply? Would those numbers be comparable? Uh, I think if, I, if you are in this setting where you can, so we like whatever the assumptions we made about the blockchain, right? Like we're in the, we have blocks, we have uh, we can take a preset order. We have a virtual machine that executes the smart contracts. Under these assumptions, we can we can sort of. Uh, like, I'm kind of thinking Visa probably needs to do with more than that. No, uh, is this Visa scale or or other systems? Oh, I think more? numbers that I've heard is like I, I think it is Visa scale because I, I think it's like I've I've heard sixty, I've heard one hundred. I, I think that's the order of magnitude the transactions okay. that they're doing. So theoretically, this engine can do that. Uh, now, again, the whole blockchain will not have that throughput, right? Because it will be a single server, right? Just doing execution, right? Uh, yeah, this is a single server doing execution, and we use uh, a lot of threads, right? So it's also non non trivial. I think like requiring thirty two cores is probably a bit too much, uh, but maybe like sixteen eight is um, quite reasonable. And I think we currently run with the uh, Default configuration parameter is eight, I think. Yeah. Uh, so the thing that I wanted to demonstrate here, so up to peer to peer transactions are a bit lighter. Uh, so it has like eight reads, uh, five writes. Um, it has, um, again, one, one, one thing is like uh, showing the, uh, just the scalability with the number of threads. But also, I think the important point here is the, the line here, right? So even fully sequential load, it's like 10, 20%, if I remember correctly, like slower than the sequential execution. And actually, to, to answer your question, I think it's, it's this world where you hope for the best. So you want to be really, really performant when things are nice and distributed and very few conflicts. But you want to be really safe and also not worse than sequential when let's say someone adversarially submits to you like a fully sequential load, right? So you want to interpolate like as, as smoothly as possible. But I square, square is a good number. I, I like it. <laughs> yeah. no, but there's, there's like some kind of instance optimality type conjecture that is formulated here, right? You'd love to say like workload by workload, you, you're like constant competitive with right. the best yes. scheduler yes. tailored to that workload, right? Yeah. That'd be yeah. Really cool. It would, it would have to be competitive analysis. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Yeah. I would guess that's possible. So once you have a guess, 
wouldn't the, something that's just like maliciously, like adversarially, just violates all your guesses be making you worse in that particular instance? But just, I mean, because it's a big design space, you have to think about it. I, I, so. Yeah. So, so this is this is my last slide, I guess. There is a bunch of extensions. This was what we wrote a long time ago. Uh, we now know many more things that can be combined with where you mean experimenting with actually tracking the commits with like as, as little overhead as possible, for instance. Uh, and, uh, and, and and many other many other aspects. But these are some immediate things that one could think about, like um, sort of a concept of nested transactions, because right now the failure granularity is a whole transaction, and maybe you want to have like sort of sub blocks where you, you just have to abort something smaller. Uh, like you have a loop that internally means many things and one of them fails, you, you know that it's fine. Uh, you don't have to re-execute the whole loop. Uh, you could combine this with minor replay maybe, right? Because uh, this is just the way that the miner could do it and then he can extract stuff from the multi-version data structure and send it to others. And those, the numbers that are reported there, and it's very believable, like once you know the dependencies, you can be faster than us, right? It's like not a, not a question. But again, you would have to overcome this uh, trust and other assumptions. Uh, we explicit, we didn't optimize for non-uniform memory access. That means like machines where uh, you have multiple sockets, like so you can have like 32 cores here and 32 cores here, and total you have 64. But the but things then you data locality becomes the main thing in those algorithms, and you have to sort of design your algorithm specifically to scale beyond out of out of socket. But first, because it's the blockchain setting, and we don't, we're not necessarily trying to just require these very expensive machines. So it's, but it would be, it would be interesting research space to to generalize it. It should be possible, but it doesn't. What we have right now doesn't doesn't scale out of socket. And the same about hyperthreading, because like usually some architectures has like two threads that run on the same core. Uh, but but we we decide, like uh, only one of them makes uh, pr progress at any given time. But you can you can amortize some like uh, sort of I/O and, and and things and benefit from. It. But again, we didn't we didn't design our algorithm in such a way to take uh, exploit these things, and it's a it's an interesting direction. Actually, even in, in our setting, because we the experiments here read from uh, read from in memory, but in reality things are coming from storage, right? And in general, I guess we have many other problems. Storage is a huge problem, which I don't know if, like, yeah, the, there is authenticated storage, obviously, for blockchains. It's like a huge source of uh, performance bottleneck. And in general, I think uh, the biggest open problem out there in the blockchain space is sharding, which we have to solve if blockchains have to get to uh, sort of the promised land. Uh, which we believe and we're we're working hard on it, but uh, yeah, I think some of the open things. Thanks.